So what happens if you're at like a certain level and a shark or something dangerous comes your way? Has that ever happened? And then how do you, what do you do? Uh, usually you take pictures of it. <laughs> you have no fear. I don't, yeah. I don't. Yeah. So sharks are the, the least of our problems. I mean, actually, every time I see one, I just turn around and have to take a picture or photograph it. But I have a really cool video of us ignoring a shark because we just <laughs> found this beautiful new species. Yeah. What kind of shark? A six gill shark. It's really big. And you can hear us talking to over it. Look at the shark. Look at the shark with the helium yeah. voice and everything. <laughs> So these reefs you're looking at, they're four or 500 feet down in the ocean. Do you remember when you first started to do these deep dives, were you surprised by what you found? Yes, we are always surprised by, we know we're going to find species that have never been collected before, never been mm -hmm. seen before. In my case, it's always fish because I study fish, but other things too, nudibranchs, crustaceans, corals, there's always new species there, novelty. Then we know we're going to find them, but it's always exciting to find them because it's like you're discovering something new right there. And then it's really cool. Did you think that they were going to be there? Like, how did you, how did it come to your mind? Because it's kind of hard to get down to that depth. So we knew that they were there because sea level fluctuates. So when the sea level is lower, reefs grow lower along the shorelines. And then when the sea level goes up, the corals die because there's not enough light. It gets too cold, but they leave their skeleton behind. So they leave the structural complexity behind. So we knew in places where there's tropical reefs, there would probably be those deep reefs too. And they're quite different from both the shallower waters and the deeper, like real deep sea habitats. So we knew they were there. We just didn't know what was there and how different it was from the shallows. So you know it's there. You don't know how deep it is. What do you decide? Like, do you need to get a submersible? Like, what 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 goes through your mind about how you're going to explore these reefs? Ideally, in, if we had enough, like, unlimited funding, we would pick an island. I don't know. I've been going to the Maldives a lot lately. So say we go to the Maldives and then we dive for about a week with a submersible or an ROV just to find the best reefs to dive in. Mm -hmm. And then we start the technical diving after that, but we don't have access to that usually. So we just try to find a reef with a very steep drop off and mm -hmm. a vertical profile. And we dive there and we hope we find a reef at the right depth. For the audience, can you just explain the significance of the reefs? And a lot of people don't even understand why it's important, why we're protecting them, or just what their role is in the ecosystem. Shallow reefs or, or reefs in general? If you mean? Well, reefs in general. I mean, yeah. you're going down and you, then you find other things underneath. Yeah, there. a lot of people try to explain that in terms of human benefits. I, I usually don't, but I will anyways, because it's what people expect to, to hear. There's a lot of people that depend on reefs for food for tourism. So depending on how you count it, over a billion people directly depend on reefs for protein, for food, for coastal protection. If there's a hurricane or a typhoon that comes by, the waves don't break property along the shoreline because the reefs stop the, the, the energy from the waves before they reach the shore. They're a source of bio compounds, so they can be used by the pharmaceutical company to create all kinds of medicines and things like that. But I like them because I think they're the most beautiful ecosystem in the planet and it shouldn't be destroyed. So at four or 500 feet, how much light is there at that depth? That's a, it's a good question. And it, it varies a lot depending on how clear the water is in the surface. So if it's a place with really clear water on the surface, for example, Palau, at four or 500 feet, we expect to see some light. We still take flashlights and, and external artificial light just to light it more and be able to see this, the little fish especially. But we know there's going to be light there because the water in the surface is really transparent. If it's in a place like the Philippines, where the water in the surface, it, it's clear, but there's a lot of nutrients in it. So it's like that kind of greenish water. It's not like that pure blue transparent water from Palau. It's like a greenish water. Then in those cases, at 400 feet, it can be pitch black. It can be like a night dive. The first one of these reefs, like, you know, it's there, but you, you haven't seen it. What do you send down first to explore? Is it a vehicle with a person inside it? What exactly are you sending down to look at? We, we usually go ourselves. <laughs> we don't send anything. If we had the budget for it and the right team, we could send either a submersible with a person or an ROV. But in all of the places we've been to, we just pick a place and, and we dive. We don't explore. Most of the time, I would say 90% of the time, 95% of the time, we find something that's worth the dive. 
Mm -hmm. In very few occasions, it's just a sand bottom and we don't find anything and we turn around and come back and we lose the day. Right. How long is the travel down? The travel down is really quick. We go as fast as we can, usually five to 10 minutes. We're at 300, 400 feet. Coming up is what takes a lot of time because we have to decompress. So coming up, depending on how deep we go and how long we stay, it can take anywhere from two to five hours to come up. Wow. Wait, I mean, seriously, like, yeah. what are you doing for those hours? Are you playing great games? Like, well, how are you, what are you doing on the way up? It, it depends a lot. So we always try to dive on a, on a profile of a reef that's very vertical. So we can go down along the reef and then come up along the reef. If that happens, we keep working. We, even in the shallows, we keep doing transects. We keep taking pictures. We keep looking at the reef. We have something to do. In some places, when the profile of the reef is not vertical, it's more gentle profile, then we have to come up along an anchor line or something like that. And that's very boring. We do in all of the above, I guess. There was a place where we were testing these underwater iPads and we took iPads to and we play games and think playing games is really bad because you lose a lot of the dexterity. You can't control the things, right? So it's like very frustrating. Yeah. But it's good enough to read books, for example, on an iPad. And what are you using for your breathing apparatus? We, so we use an equipment called the rebreather. It's slightly different than normal scuba gear. Normal scuba gear, when you inhale, you exhale, the gas comes out as bubbles. To go to those depths, we have to breathe helium because of the way that oxygen and nitrogen interact physiologically with our body when we're breathing under pressure, we can't breathe air at those depths. So we have to replace oxygen and nitrogen with an inert gas. So it's a gas that doesn't interact badly physiologically with our body. And we have replaced that with helium. Wow. Helium is a very expensive gas. So we can't be breathing in and then out as bubbles every time and we waste a lot of helium. So we use a rebreather. It's an equipment that recirculates the gas. And there's sensors that monitor the amount of oxygen. So they just add as much oxygen as you need. And then there's a filter that removes CO2. So you're breathing the same helium over and over again with added oxygen and less CO2. So the first time you, you kind of know that the thing you want to see is there, which was the first reef that you dove on? Philippines, maybe. We started doing a lot of deep dives in the Philippines were the first ones that we started going deep. And in general, we don't know what to expect when we go. Mm -hmm. It's always a surprise. So it's, I think it's actually one of the things that's more exciting about it is that we, you never know what you're going to find. So what does it make you think about, you know, the oceans? Does it make you think that there's a lot more life down there than we know about? And in most of these dives, I imagine you're probably the only people who've ever seen this sort of diversity that's down there. Absolutely. Always makes us think that there's much, much more than we know. And it's it's always surprising to see things that nobody has ever seen before. And it's always sad too. It's not it's very rare that I do a dive, even to a place where nobody has ever been to before, that I don't see signs of human impact, like a broken fishing line or a net or an anchor or trash or all of the above. Mm -hmm. You know, you discover new species. When you're looking at these ecosystems, are there unusual things? Are these fish smaller than you would think because they're deeper? Or are they bigger? What do you observe when you're down there? In terms of size, I think they're what I would expect. Their colors are not what we would expect. They're too red for the most part. Too warm colors. The wavelength of their colors doesn't exist at those depths. Mm -hmm. So the water, the light penetrates in water in an interesting way. So water is like a filter to light. The deeper you go, the less warmer colors there are. So right. the first wavelengths that get filtered out of the water as the light penetrates are the warm side ones. So there's no red, there's no yellow, there's no pink. Yet there's a lot of fish at those depths that are those colors. They're yellow. We can see them when we put the artificial light on. But there's no red light there. So we're still trying to figure out why they have those colors that are not present in their habitat. What's the theory? Like maybe a fish swam down from higher up to get to that depth or, or there's some adaptive quality to the tone I, of the color? Yeah, I think there's some adaptive reason for that. And a lot of the fish that are there are part of families, are part of whole groups of fish that don't have relatives in the shallow water. So I think it's, it's adaptive. It can be, so when, when you combine, for example, red and yellow at those depths, it almost looks like black and white. So it can be added contrast 
it can be camouflage because that light doesn't reflect. There's no wavelengths because the color doesn't reflect that light. They can blend with the background more easily. We're, we're just beginning to understand that now. I, I have two questions. One is the water temperature. You know, is it colder down there? And then also, yes, who are the predators? Are you studying who might be the predators down there? Or as Jesse said, maybe they're migrating down, you know. I'm just curious about that. The predators in general are similar to the ones we see in the shallows, in the shallow reef, I mean. So there's sharks, there's snappers, there's groupers, and those are the typical predators you see in, in a shallow reef. Some of them move up and down. Sharks, for example, they, they change their depth a lot. So they might be at 10 feet and then decide to go back all the way down to 400 feet to try to catch fish and then come back up in, in a few minutes. So they can do that. Groupers and other predators in general, if they're at a certain depth, they don't change a lot. They're more site specific than sharks. Temperature changes a lot. It's interesting how it changes in the ocean because there's so much water. There's different water masses. So it's not like you go down a little bit and it gets a little bit colder. And then you go down a little bit and gets a little bit colder. It's split in different water masses. So usually in general, from the surface to about 150 feet, it's one temperature. And then between 150 and 300 feet is another temperature and below 300 feet is another temperature and always gets that gets oh. older. But those differences in temperature, because they're also related with differences in salinity, that the water doesn't mix. So it's, it's really interesting. Sometimes you see the, the thermocline. So you see the difference in temperature, that wavy things in the water that you see. Sometimes we get to like 150, 200 feet and we see that and we know there's going to be a big difference in temperature. Sometimes we can put the hand inside the cold water and feel it's colder right there. So, it, and it drops, sometimes it drops by a lot, by as much as 10, 20 degrees. So it can be 82, 84 in the surface. And at 500 feet, sometimes you can get to 60 degree waters, 55 degree waters Fahrenheit. You know, it sounds like you're always going into a new environment that nobody's really been in, that there's no, you know, knowledge about, you know, is your face mask, when you're looking through your face mask, is your vision exactly the same as, as your vision at the top down to the depth of four to 500 feet? Yes, yes, it is exactly the same. The difference is that we put the lights on mm -hmm. when it gets a little darker and we can get those, those wavelengths back, the warm colors, the reds and the yellows. And the, so it's, it's more colorful than what I would be seeing if the lights would be off. Now, when you're down there and you're turning on lights, that that depth, none of those creatures have ever seen light, or have they? Uh, no, for, for the most part, they they haven't. They they get scared. So sometimes what I do is I would have a flashlight attached to me, and then it, the flashlight's always pointing down. And then if I see something, if I see a hole or a little cave or something that's a little darker that I want to see what's inside, I quickly pull it up and I point it to that. And if it's there's something interesting. Then I try to, to either take a picture or chase it, but I usually, I don't have all of my lights on in front of me because it usually scares, scares things away, fish in specific, yeah. And, you know, I imagine there must be giant groupers and, I mean, there must be some huge fish down there, no? Not as much as you would think because uh, fishermen also know that those fish are there. So they are fished, they're caught. So in general, there's not a whole lot of difference in terms of the amount of predators that you see in the shallow versus the deep reefs, specifically because the fishermen know exactly where those deep reefs are and they catch them as much as they do in the shallows. What is the most surprising thing you've ever seen, you know, that you were shocked by in one of these going down really? Every time it's the signs of human impact. We will go to like, doesn't matter, the most remote place you can think of. We did an expedition to an island that is almost halfway between Brazil and Africa in the middle of the Atlantic. So it's about, I don't know, 700 miles from the Brazilian coast and 1,500 miles from Africa. It doesn't get much more remote than that. And when you get to 400 feet, you see pipes and pieces of plastic and bottles and, and you catch a new species of fish and then you look around and there's a fishing line. So that's always what? impacts me the most is the swinging emotions between going from, oh, this is a place that nobody has ever seen before, and then look around and see a, a sign of, of human presence. So the Marshall Islands, how did you decide to go to the Marshall Islands? We have been trying to survey as many places as possible. And what makes us decide which specific place depends on a lot of things. Collaboration with local scientists, how easy it is to get the support for the technical diving. So as I said, we need to breed helium. It's not a lot of places where you can buy helium. 
this type of diving, it, it's relatively risky. We haven't needed. There's something called the decompression chamber where you can put divers. If a diver gets decompression sickness, which is related to, to diving too deep and for too long, they have to go into that chamber. So we have to be in a place where there's a chamber nearby. We haven't needed one yet, our team, but we also, I mean, because of safety, we have to be close to one. So there's all those factors. And then Marshall Islands was one of the places where it fulfilled all of these conditions. Now, these places, you know, this is where all the nuclear weapons were tested. So, you know, how many explosions were there on these islands? And do you ever worry that there's residual radiation still there? Yeah, so I went to Bikini Atoll. That's the main one where the testing was done. I don't know exactly how many tests were done. You can probably, let me Google it here, and I can tell you exactly how many tests. There were 24 nuclear tests between 1946 and 1958. 1958 was the last one. It was the biggest, and they stopped after that because they decided they didn't need to go any bigger. Now, can we assume that every all life was you know, <laughs> leveled, you know, at that point? In the vicinity of the test, yeah, on the surface of the island, for sure. Underwater, probably not, because the impact of the explosion doesn't propagate as much underwater. It's water is such a dense medium, but I would say probably all of the terrestrial stuff was wiped out. The, the last test, the one in 1958, was the Bravo test, and that was a thousand times more powerful than Hiroshima. Oh my God, that's insane. Uh, exactly. That's um, insane. I, yeah. But what were you thinking when you were going there? Yeah. Were you thinking you, you'd find like nothing? Um, <laughs> yeah, craters or what, what did you think yeah. you'd find? Yeah, I thought I was going to find nothing. Yeah. So 2006 was when I was there. That's what, 48 years after the explosion. I found one of the best reefs I've ever seen in my life. Granted, I wasn't exactly where the explosion happened inside the crater. I was just outside of it, about one mile outside of it on the outer reef. But I still, I was surprised at how much coral and how much sharks and, and big predators so I saw. That's not a good, that's not a good thing for to stop the arms race. Like, you know, but why do you think that it was so beautiful, you know, so beautiful? What do you think? 48 years without humans. Oh, okay. Um, so the island is still off limits because of the effects of radiation. The baseline radiation is low enough that you can go and dive there. So there's a tour operator in the, in the Marshall Islands that takes people there. People go surfing there. There's really good surfing points, but they still don't want anybody eating food that was grown on the island. Right. And they don't want people fishing there either right. to eat fish from there. So they, they keep people off. So that, because there's no fishing and no people living in the island, the, the reef had a chance to recover and it did recover very nicely. What do you think that means for conservation efforts around the world? It's like, you know, we do have those marine areas that, you know, are off limits. They seem to be rebounding pretty nicely. Yeah. Yeah. So if you take that, it means that if you take people out of the equation, things usually rebound. It doesn't mean that this is the only solution. In I'm, I know that reefs can exist with humans. They have for thousands of years. So we can fish on a reef in a way that it doesn't completely destroy it. It just has to be done sustainably. So in some places, you can have a very healthy reef with a limited amount of fishing, local fishing happening. In other cases, if the reef is very damaged by other things, say there's also sewage pollution and there's also the effects of global warming happening and there are coral bleaching, then in those cases, the only way to, to recover the reef might be to keep all of the activities out. I think it's the key to conservation is that we have to think that it's different solutions for different places. So, you know, you have this idea that you're going to explore these deep sea reefs. How do you assemble your team? I mean, I imagine it's not, this is a very difficult way to dive. I yeah. mean, you need to have really specific training. Of, right. I imagine you have to have a deep love of the ocean and, and uh, you know, what, how do you go about assembling a team? Yeah, in, in my case, the biggest hurdle is the, the training, the dive training. It's not for everybody. It's a lot of gear. Usually for the deepest dives, if my gear, if I put it all together in a scale, so I weigh 160 pounds, my gear probably weighs close to 200 pounds. So it's I carry more gear than than, than I weigh. It's physically intensive. It's, it's mentally intensive because it's not a trivial dive when you go down to 500 feet. It's not for everybody. So I think that the main criteria to be part of a team like mine would be being okay with that kind of diving. 
Now, there's a claustrophobic element to it. Yeah. For you, Jesse, and for me. No, I, th I think once you're down, you're down. I mean, it's like probably at first, it, it, it's an overwhelming feeling. Yeah. Um, there is definitely a, a, an element. It doesn't affect me. I never had it. I, I never felt it. Even when I started diving in the early days, just doing shallow dives with normal scuba gear, there, there's people. I, I worked as a dive master in a dive school for a while. Mm -hmm. There's always some students that after the first or second dive, they're like, no, this is not for me. It's too claustrophobic. Even the, the normal type of diving, there's people right. that don't even like looking inside the mask. Right. But for me, it didn't, it doesn't affect me at all. I'm completely fine with it. And we do when those deep dives, the decompression is so much of a limit that we call it a ceiling mm -hmm. that we can't go over. When you're coming up with 200 pounds on your back, even though you're in the water and it, it feels lighter, is that yeah. is it hard to push that up? And is it hard to is it hard to stay at the levels you need to stay at very specifically? Yeah, the buoyancy is relatively easy to control because we have a bladder. It's called a buoyancy compensator. It's a BC that we can add gas to it and make it make us float a little more so to actually break the weight and everything. But swimming is really hard. So if we have to swim like I don't know, 100 feet, that, that's a lot of effort. So we always dive with a scooter, a dive propulsion vehicle that it's like a little propeller thing that we have a trigger and we turn it on and it just pulls us around. But you could go laterally, right? Yes. So what happens if you're at like a certain level and a shark or something dangerous comes your way? Has that ever happened? And then how do you, what do you do? Uh, usually you take pictures of it. <laughs> you have no fear. I don't, yeah. I don't understand. This is not hard. We can yeah, so sharks are the, the least of our problems. I mean, actually, every time I see one, I just turn around and have to take a picture or photograph it. But I have a really cool video of us ignoring a shark because we just <laughs> found this beautiful new species. Yeah, what kind Thank of shark? You. A six gill shark. It's really big. And you can hear us talking to over it. Look at the shark. Look at the shark with the helium yeah. voice and everything. <laughs> But wait, we've got to see this new species. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. we'll get back to you. Yeah. Have you ever seen a giant squid or do you ever see whales down at that level? Do they ever- Not giant squids, no. And not whales either. Whales don't come usually that close to the reef. Right. In some places though, I went to Guadalupe Island in the Caribbean earlier this year and we hear whales. We heard in that particular dive site, we heard whales constantly the whole day. Like it felt like they were- I don't know, a hundred yards away, but they were much further because they, they're very loud when they sing. So we heard them during the entire dive, but I never saw one dive. Oh, how wonderful. Now, what were some of the most surprising things? Because you've you've identified new species, yeah? Yeah, yeah we've identified a lot can, of new species. Can, can you communicate with the other divers when you're down there or not at all? Kind of. <laughs> yeah. So when you're normally diving, the regulator that we have, when you exhale, it's bubbles. So when you try to speak through it, it comes out as bubbles and you can't really communicate. But the rebreather, because it's a, like a, a wider tube with, with gas in it, if you speak loudly, the other person can hear the noise. And sometimes if we, if we know each other well enough, we can, we can kind of communicate through that. But we don't have a special like communicator that, that keeps us in touch with each other. But we can kind of say things, let's go up. And then sometimes the person will understand it or not. But when you see a new species, like what, you know, I imagine it's got to be exciting. Yeah. Yeah. We yell and we point at it. And sometimes I take a picture of it and show the other person the, the, the photo of it. Yeah, it's, it's always super exciting. And uh, we usually have different tasks too. So one person will be with a camera, the other one will be the nets to try to catch it and so on. How do you know that it's a new species? For the most part, we know the fauna well enough that if we find something that it's completely different and by completely different, I mean, usually by color. So if the color is very different, then we can suspect that's a new species. And depending on how different it is, sometimes we have to do a lot of other tests to make sure it's different, including DNA sequencing that we do very often. But sometimes it's so different that we know immediately that's new. When you bring them back to study them, they also have to go through decompression. Is that? Yes, they Explain do. That. That's yeah. wild. So that's if you want to bring them alive. Sometimes if we need to bring them just for scientific study, or for describing any species, for example, we don't need to keep them alive. We can just 
sacrifice them, put them in a jar in a museum. There's a whole bunch of jars here behind me in my. Oh, will you hold some up? Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. So here's uh, here's a big jar with fish that we collected in the Maldives. So they are preserved. The liquid in here is alcohol, and we have a very large scientific fish collection here at the California Academy of Sciences. Um, so we have fish in the collection that date back to the 1800s and they're preserved like this and they're in perfect shape so we can keep studying them and using different tools and techniques and so on. And those uh, eventually we went up in the collection after we described them properly, we give them scientific names. We also have a public aquarium here with live fish. So if we want to bring the fish back alive to put in a tank, then we have to do the decompression with them. Now for us, if we spend five minutes at 500 feet, we have to do four or five hours of, of decompression. But the fish, they live their entire lives there. So their decompression is much slower than that. So we usually, uh, we put them in a fish decompression chamber, which is this thing here. Right. It's a whole contraption. Wow. We put them inside this tube and then there's a, a, a cover here that's that's pressure, pressure sealed. So when we close this, and we lock it, then the, the pressure, it, this stays pressurized. And then we can send this straight to the surface. The pressure will stay inside. So we send it straight to the surface. And then the, the aquarium biologists, they connect the whole thing to pumps. And then they release the pressure from here very, very slowly over days instead of hours uh, that would be for us. So using this, we bring them back alive all the way here. And then we keep them in our exhibit here alive. So you equalize the pressure. So you don't need special fish tanks. Once they're up there, they just exactly. need to be right. And how much gear do you bring down with you? It depends on what the mission is. So when we're catching fish, we have to bring that that I just showed you, the decompression chamber, plus the rebreather, which weighs a lot. Plus the rebreather is a very reliable piece of equipment, but it's not infallible. So we bring extra tanks in case the rebreather fails. We have an right. additional alternative source of gas to go to. We call that bailout bail out tanks in case the rebreather fails. Then we bring the scooter, the one to propel you, so we don't have to swim with all of that gear attached to you. Underwater camera, fish nets, catch bag. So it depends on, on what we're doing. And we usually do just one task, again, for safety. I don't want to be dealing with a camera and fish nets and a decompression chamber and all of that. So it's usually one task per diver. So if I decide that I'm going to take pictures in that dive, I don't take nets. I don't take the compression chamber. I just take my camera. So Noah does all this kind of research at these very, very deep depths. What do they think of this work? Do you work with them? You know, national... What's I about? work with them sometimes, uh, yeah. but they don't do it by diving. They do it with submarines. Right. And they go a little bit deeper too. They do some work in the mesophotic, which is the zone that I specialize in studying between 100 and 400, 500 feet. Mm -hmm. But the studies they do at those depths are with ROVs and with submarines. And you can study a lot of things at those depths with those instruments, but not the fish. <laughs> right. The submarine is very noisy with all of the lights and everything. They scare all the fish off. So it's, it's much harder to study the fish with a submarine than it is by diving. Well, depending on how you define it. So the diving requires the training and the equipment and everything. So, How long does it take to plan for a specific dive? Like when you want to do the Maldives, I, do you just go or do you have does it take a while to do and and do you have to do a lot of prep before you get there about what you think you might find it really varies between location so if it's a place where there's a lot of support for this kind of diving for technical diving like for example in the philippines we didn't have to take much because they had a, a, a shop a scuba shop there that was specialized in this kind of diving really? so we didn't have to buy the helium we didn't have to fill our own tanks. They did that all for us. In the Maldives, we have to bring all of the equipment even to fill the tanks. So we have to fill the tanks for ourselves. So in the Maldives, we take a lot more equipment than we do for the Philippines, for example. And that requires more, more time for logistics and more preparation. But I think what takes the most time in terms of preparation is all of the scientific permitting that we have to obtain and establishing local collaborations. We never go to a place and just drop and collect everything and come out. We always like collaborating with local scientists and establishing local partnerships and all of that takes time. They're probably excited to, to get more information about what's in their waters, yeah? Absolutely, yeah. So you asked about what kind of preparation there is in terms of what you're going to find. In the Philippines, we had some background information that we prepared ourselves, but in the Maldives, for example, there is nothing known. 
So we had no idea what we we're going to find. We were just like a complete surprise. So in, in, in some places, there's not much preparation you can't do because there's no information available. And in all of those places, it's it's really good when we go because we all of the information we get is the first that comes out of its kind. You know, uh, there's a dive shop that has tanks for this kind of diving. I mean, uh, don't imagine that this kind of diving is for just anybody. So, I mean, what what's that shop doing? Yeah, you know? amazingly, there is some people that do this kind of diving for fun. <laughs> Really? Oh, um, not as deep as we go. There's people that go to about 200 feet, 300 mm. feet, just to because they enjoy the technical side of it. There's people that like the gear that's right. associated with it and the complexity. If I had to come up with an analogy, for example, of how, how difficult this is. So if, if you say that the normal scuba diving would require the amount of training that a person gets to, to drive a car, the kind of diving that I do would be equivalent to flying a small plane. So right. there's people that fly small plane as, as a hobby, right? So it's the same way with the diving. There's people that that uh, that go and do the technical diving as a hobby too. There's a shop that does this kind of diving in the Cayman Islands. In the Caribbean, it, it's relatively common, I think, because there's a lot of American divers that go there. And the American divers have more, they, they have the gear, they have access to funding in the Philippines is quite rare because there's a lot of local tourism and it's harder to get the funding for that kind of thing. But what, what made you want to do this? Like, did you start diving when you were little? Where did you grow up? I grew up in, in the coastal Brazil, in Northeast Brazil. And I, yeah, always had this, this thing with the ocean and fish. So I was always attracted to the ocean, started snorkeling as, as early as I could swim and started diving as early as I could put a tank in my back and hold it. And I always liked the discovery, the exploration side of it. So I always wanted to go deeper, always wanted to explore, always wanted to go to the islands that nobody went to. Always So the, the exploration thing, I think, it kept me going and always trying to go deeper. I mean, are you still trying to go deeper? Um, I, I might at some point. For now, there's so much to discover still at the depth that I am that I'm, I'm satisfied with the amount of species that I'm discovering and describing and pushing up as we go. You go to you, a lot of conferences and, you know, show your results, things like that. Are other scientists interested in this? You know, what's happening there? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, I just came back from Singapore a few weeks ago. We had the Asia Pacific Coral Reef Symposium. Every year, every other year, there's a, a, a conference that I go to. Later this year, I'm going to the Indo-Pacific Fish Conference in New Zealand. That's another big one that I always show my results. And yeah, people are usually interested because there's so much novelty associated with it. And there's the, the, the cool factor of the, the, the amount of gear and the, the type of diving that nobody else does. So it's, it's always good to talk about it. I'd like to ask you, I know you have a very strong point of view about conservation for the ocean that maybe is different from, you know, maybe, could you just mm -hmm. explain your point of view? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a big push right now driven by international targets to protect 30% of the ocean. And the way it's being done, I think it's really bad and prejudicial because people are looking only at area and biodiversity in the ocean and anywhere in this planet is not distributed equally. So if, if I was a politician and somebody told me you have to protect 30% of California, which is where I am, it would be easy to protect 30% of it and not make any conservation result. For example, if I protected just the places where people don't want to build houses or the places that people don't want to mine or the places that people don't want to plant anything because it's too cold or too dry. I think that's what's happening in the ocean. The ocean protection is going towards this view, not even a view, it's just protecting areas that don't need immediate protection just to reach this target. Okay. Have you have you seen um, evidence of deep sea mining at that at that at those depths? No, and that's not widespread enough that we can see it. And it's not that shallow. It's much deeper. There's no minerals at, at the depth that I dive. It's for the, the mining, it's usually thousands of feet. And the impacts of it, you're only going to see if you go down there with a submarine. You're not going to see it in the surface even. Because as I explained in the beginning, the, the water is, is split in different water masses that usually don't mix. 
So if you disturb one of the water masses, that disturbance is going to, in general, stay there. It's not going to mix with the other water masses. So if you are at 4,000 feet, 5,000 feet, and you, you completely dredge the bottom, all of that cloud that is formed by the activity, it's not going to come up to the surface, very, very unlikely. You talked about species of fish that you found. Do you also find variation in the coral? That's not my my specialty. We do mm -hmm. see a lot of different things. I take pictures constantly. I take video and I send it to my colleagues and they always find new things in the things that I find. But my thing is fish. So I try mm -hmm. to stay on that. But sometimes, for example, I found a few new species of nudibranchs because I have a colleague here at the academy that specializes in nudibranchs. So because I know he's going to work them, I study them when I bring them up. Sometimes I bring them up, but I just pick them up by randomly. Those so you asked about how I know a, a new species of fish is new. I sometimes immediately when I see one, I know it's new. With the nudibranchs, I don't even know what families they are in because that's how little I know about nudibranchs. And sometimes... What, what I, are nudibranchs? We don't know what they, they are. What uh, are. They're little... Uh, uh, oh, I don't know how if I can explain. They're mollusks, right. uh, but they don't have shells. They're super colorful. If you Google them, you see how spectacularly colorful they are. Yeah. So they're tiny little snails with yeah. shells that, that live on the bottom of the ocean, usually associated with reefs. And just catching them by random, I caught like quite a few new species because nobody's studying them at those depths either, like just like the fish. Do you have a favorite reef you've discovered? Hmm. I don't know. I, I tend to be partial to the ones in the Philippines. There's a lot going on in the Philippines so as I mentioned, when we started talking about conservation, diversity in the planet is not distributed equally. So some places there's more species than others. And in the Philippines is the place where you see the most species on a reef. It's the most diverse species in the planet. So like the Amazon is one of the most diverse forests in the world. The Philippine reefs are the most diverse in the world. So you see so much in a dive there that those, those reefs are always special. Well, to follow up on this point, though, if you were to make the recommendation, how should we be rethinking ocean conservation? Like, how do we prioritize? I would eliminate the targets. I think the biggest culprit is the target. The minute you tell a politician that you have to protect 10% or 30% of some area, they're going to find loopholes and, and try to fill it with the easiest, politically, the easiest area there is to, to protect. So they're going to pick the areas that there's no fishing going on, that there's no impacts already, which they are nice to protect, but not if you have to reach a target. Yes, I see. see. what I mean? So if, if the target is to, it's to compel like effective conservation, you might end up reaching the target without changing any conservation at all. So the biggest problem is the target. Okay, so and you're looking for the most toll that, you know, the biggest kind of destruction or whatever, the areas that are most vulnerable, and we should go there first. Yes. I mean, we need it all to happen, but I, yeah, yeah, well, that does make sense. I don't know why that would be controversial, actually. It is because I think whenever you criticize conservation, people think you're criticizing all of conservation. Mm. So when I say this reserve has no real world impact because it set aside an area where there were no impacts. So if I criticize that, people are like, oh, you're against conservation. I'm like, no, that's not the case. It's just you have to do it in the right places. Um, it would be like saying, let's protect 10% of Africa. And then we, we draw a square that is the size of Texas in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Yeah, That's, that's not to say that the Sahara doesn't need protection. It's, that's what I'm saying is that the Congo forests yeah. need much more protection than the Sahara does. So, and there's no impacts there. There's nobody hunting lions in the Sahara because there's no lions in the Sahara. So. Well, why protect that, right? And just to reach the target. So. Yes, that makes sense. You know, um, how do you name these new species? Do you, do you are you allowed to name them? You know, and I imagine the first two or three were pretty easy, but you're up to fifteen or sixteen now. So how do how do you name them? Yeah. So yes, we do get to name them if we discover them. Most of the time, and lately, especially all of the time lately, I think we're trying to change it. So traditionally. When you find a new species, and, and because taxonomy is a very traditional science, it started in the 1800s, officially the late 1700s, there was a rule back then that you'd have to use Greek and Latin names, because at the time, in the 1700s, 1800s, that was the common language used in science, 
and, and a scientist from the US, you would know what a species name meant, even if it was given the name by a German scientist, for example. Mm. So traditionally in taxonomy, everybody used Greek and Latin names or Latinized names just to be easy to transfer between cultures and languages. But that's a really like old archaic way to do it. So now lately what we're doing is using local names in whichever local language it is, because there's Google now. Anybody can Google the, with the name and, and know what it means. So we, we discovered four new species in Easter Island. We gave them Rapa Nui names, which is the official language in Easter Island. In the Maldives, the first species we named from there, we named it with a Maldivian name, Cirilabras femna. There are over a thousand species known from the Maldives. This is the first or the second species that gets, a, it's the first one that gets a, Mal, a name in a Maldivian language. There's other species that have names of places in the Maldives, but this is the first one that gets a Maldivian name. And that just causes people locally to, to recognize them as, as their own species. It's not like this, this foreign Greek Latin name and they learn the scientific names because it's in their own language. So, um, we're, we're trying to do that as much as possible now. It's just giving like local names to the species where we discovered it. That's a beautiful concept. That's wonderful. 